Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And my name is uh, Peter Alexander. I hold the South African Research Chair in Social Change. And on behalf of myself and Professor Camilla Naidu, who is the head of the Sociology Department, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's lecture. Before I hand over to um, Professor Mawala, who is chairing this evening, there are uh, a few words of thanks um, I'd like to offer you on behalf of myself and uh, Professor Naidu. Uh, the first of these is to Professor Jaliti Mawala, who is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research at this university. We're grateful that he could find the time uh, to uh, chair us um, and to steer our way through interesting discussion uh, later on. Uh, the second, of course, is to Professor Budawai, um, who is sitting below us at the moment, um, and we'll be hearing a lot from him later. We're extremely grateful to him because he's come all of the way from California just for this uh, lecture. And then he has to go back again, I think, on, on Friday. Uh, and I think it's quite amazing the way in which he copes with traveling from one continent to another uh, and surviving the jet lag like nobody else could, could possibly do. So Michael, thank you very much indeed for, for being with us this evening. Um, there are a few other uh, thanks. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the, the presence of a few people, um, some of whom you'll hear from uh, later, later on. Uh, first of all, Dr. Thomas uh, Alfred Heider, who is the Deputy, uh, a Deputy Director General of the Department of Science and Technology, and he's representing the uh, Director General um, at, our, at our lecture. Um, uh, secondly, I'd like um, to uh, acknowledge the presence of Dr. Bern Antambeleni, who is an Executive Director at the National Research Foundation. And I'm particularly pleased that these two gentlemen could be with us uh, because the South African Research Chair in Social Change is funded by the DST and it's administered by the National uh, Research Foundation. So we're very pleased that you're here uh, with us. Um, then I'd, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Omar Dupassi, who will be introducing Michael. Omar is president of the South African Sociological Association. Uh, so today in Cape Town, there's just about one president, uh, but we have today here two presidents before you, um, and I'm sure that will add to the quality of the proceedings. Um, we're grateful to the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and the faculty for providing a nice spread of food uh, that you'll be able to enjoy um, after the lecture. So thank you to the Dean, Professor uh, Lionel um, Posthumus. I'm also grateful to the uh, organizers of the Wednesday seminar uh, who have given up their splog and, and helped to organize this evening's event and to the organizers of a colloquium being held tomorrow that Michael will be um, participating in. I, I apologize to anybody who I haven't acknowledged and thanked for being here, but there are two further uh, acknowledgements that I wish to provide. The first is that we are joined this evening um, by representatives from a number of uh, social movements, direct experience, uh, on the subject that Michael will be speaking about. Uh, they come from the Soweto Electricity Crisis Committee, uh, from uh, Beckersdale, from the Tembelikle Crisis Committee, and the Makauza Community Development Forum. And those are all names which I'm sure you've heard of in the news. Uh, these are hotspots, so we're very pleased to have representatives from this particular area, and um, I'm hoping that they will contribute to the discussion. But our very special guests this evening come from um, Madakana. Um, we have people here who were on the, on the mountain on the 16th of August when that terrible massacre occurred. Uh, they are the leaders, some of them are the leaders of that movement amongst the um, mine workers, and one of them um, you'll be hearing from um, later. And we also have uh, women here from Sakala uh, who have been involved in organizing Marathon ever since the massacre. Um, they've all suffered enormously from the um, massacre and what followed after the massacre, and then more recently from participating in a grueling strike, the longest strike in, in, in South African his, mining history, um, the biggest strike in South African uh, mi mining history. 
Um, and I'd like to ask uh, the comrades from Marakana if they would stand, please. Um, uh, all of you uh, to, to stand, um, just so that everybody here has an opportunity to thank you very much. For being here. And without further ado, I'll hand you over to Professor Mawala. Uh, is this mic uh, working? Use this one as well. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I see a great deal of activists. I was uh, joking with uh, the gentleman wearing a, a, a red cap. I think they're called fighters or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I was watching the proceedings in Parliament today, and uh, it was really quite uh, colorful. Uh, we do have a colorful democracy. Uh, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the University of Johannesburg. Uh, this is the largest university in Johannesburg, 50,000 students. And I think it is uh, appropriate that uh, an event of this magnitude uh, would have come to uh, the University of Johannesburg. Our mandate as the University of Johannesburg is to make education accessible, you know, to turn the children of the working class in addition to uh, assisting uh, uh, working with all classes in, in our society, but in particular to, to make uh, uh, the children of the working class have access to higher education, which is very, very important. And I think the topic, I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer, so some of the terminologies that are being used, neoliberalism. <laughs> <laughs> It's not exactly equivalent to uh, stress and strain distribution <laughs> or social movement. You know? But it is exciting because I think as a society, we need to have dialogue, we need to talk, uh, we need to express our views, and we need to participate in, in the sociological evolution of, of our society. Uh, at the University of Johannesburg, uh, there are a few things that I would like to talk to you about. Uh, one of it is research. It is important for us that uh, our <coughs> academics and our students are involved in research. Uh, and research uh, uh, for us means uh, publishing, <coughs> whether it is a book. And uh, Peter Alexander uh, did publish a book on Marital uh, Even though after that, I had to get him to <laughs> but, uh, but this is what we want, that uh, issues uh, that, uh, that are discussed have to be written. I don't know who said it, uh, knowledge not, uh, not shared is no knowledge at all. And, uh, and the most effective way of sharing knowledge is actually to write it down. Now, we have relied quite a great deal on oral traditions. And the problem with oral traditions is that uh, as uh, knowledge moves from one generation to another, it becomes distorted, and uh, the accuracy of the information that was uh, conveyed uh, becomes distorted and it becomes something else. So writing is very, very important. And we encourage uh, all of you to write. And uh, to write, uh, no matter how controversial topics are, you know, uh, whether it is about Maritana, uh, these are difficult uh, uh, topics, but uh, sometimes uh, 50 years from today, somebody must be able to, to go and read the literature uh, around at that time and be able to, to probably construct a picture of what exactly happened uh, so that uh, we can then, the generation that will be in existence at that point will be able to learn from that uh, experience. Uh, with those few words, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Duplessis. Uh, to introduce ourselves. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Marwala, to Peter Alexander, Chair of the South African Research Chains and Social Chains, to Professor Kamala Nadu, Head of the Department of Sociology, Professor Tim Harris, ISA Vice President, and colleagues, scholars, and activists, community organizers, organizers, students in training as activists or scholars or scholars and it's very, very nice to be here today to welcome Professor Michael Burwa. And um, when I welcome you, I say, Professor Burwa, um, you've been a long-term interlocutor, a collaborator, a 
which has more than one meaning, but I mean in the solidarity <laughs> sense. <laughs> the provocationist, uh, someone who has brought irony, humor, commitment, and above all, an ongoing engagement with a global world, uh, with local connections. It's um, the fact that all of you are here means there's hardly any introduction required, <coughs> but there's something to be said for, for going through the range of achievements and contributions for which we honor you, and in which in range I think you are honored by a range of people in themselves, committed, scholarly, engaged, at a moment in which we are fighting on many fronts for the kind of society that has faith, that is durable, that is just and everything. And um, it's both a moment to celebrate your presence here, and it's a moment to recognize a very important historic moment. So I introduce you to Professor Burwoy, who is the author of many influential books, Manufacturing Consent, Politics of Production, Global Ethnography, I'm not mentioning all conversations with Bordia, which clearly is close to heart, and identifies Johannesburg as a space for, for dialogue, for contestation, for complexity. You're also the person who would introduce others. I, I have to say, um, the extended case study method um, is a really fine piece of writing. Um, public sociology, which in South Africa perhaps <coughs> seems to sociologists here the way we do it, but does not seem so everywhere. And um, above all the commitments, a long term interpreter of, of Marx, I think, in my view, a Gramscian at heart, once a Gramscian, always a Gramscian, despite the conversations with Bordier, with Bauman, I see it's grouchy. It's practice, and it's praxis, practice, and respect for the text, textuality and engagement. Uh, I think you're very, very welcome here. I hope we're going to have, as always, a really um, serious set of engagements. This is the community itself, and when I speak about the community, I mean this is for Christ in itself of many communities with our own contestations, our own politics of contention, our own divides and division, but <coughs> remarkable commitment to a, a different kind of social order, which, um, for which you, one person that provides and always contributes, you facilitate both the process and the debate. Mm -hmm. We most work. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't need that. I got, I'm so strapped with mics here that <laughs> I hope they're not bombs. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you very much, Irma. I have to call you Irma. Um, it's, really, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Mawala, uh, for, being, for pres presiding in that wonderful chair. Um, thanks for Peter Alexander, wherever he's gone. Has he disappeared already? Oh, there he is on the floor. Yes. <laughs> um, for orchestrating together with a number of his collaborators this wonderful occasion, this colloquium on social movements. Um, it's, a bit, it's a bit intimidating to be in this room, um, uh, but it is also very, very exciting for me to be here in South Africa. Um, I... Actually, there are many people I know quite well here. One of my oldest friends, I must acknowledge him, Eddie Webster, who I met in 1968, which is a long time ago, before most of you were born. <laughs> right. <laughs> before your parents were born. <laughs> yes, well, yes, uh, he is a grandfather. Um, <laughs> in many senses of the word. But anyway, there are many people here. I must recognize Tina Ace, too, who I've worked with for many years on the, in the International Sociological Association. She is now uh, Vice President for National Associations. In fact, I was Vice President before her for National Associations. Um, there are many others. Please don't be offended if I don't recognize you. Um, uh, so I am here to talk to you about apparently social movements in the neoliberal age. I'm sorry if this is a very complicated vocabulary for engineers. Um, you were, we were talking before about fuzzy logic. That's pretty, pretty complicated too for me. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, 
Now, I just arrived a few hours ago, and it's really difficult to fly into South Africa and give a talk um, like this. Um, it's, it's, it's like, I don't know, I'm just coming from the United States. You know, it's only a few hours away, but it is so far away politically uh, <laughs> and economically. I mean, I was thinking, what is the parallel? I was thinking, perhaps it's like it's, it's coming from, from, I don't know, from the, the planet Neptune, which uh, to my mind seems so cold and boring, um, to perhaps to Venus, perhaps more likely to Mercury, you know, that, that, that planet right next to the sun that, so, that moves so quickly and is so hot because it's so near the sun. That's where it's like coming here. Um, and and it, 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 it always strikes me that this has always been, I was actually first time here in 1966, and what struck me then, what struck me every time I have been here since, is how vibrant and political absolutely every moment of your existence, in my existence, your existence in South Africa is. Um, and whether, whoever you are talking with, it becomes and is a political event. Um, and so it, it's, it's on the one hand very, very exciting to be here, but I think this is a moment in history, and I think uh, Irma's implying that too. This is a moment in history that's not just exciting, but also quite terrifying. Um, there are so many possibilities and so many challenges South Africa faces, perhaps in some ways more deeper than the period of apartheid. So um, what I want to do today is to perhaps open up the idea of social movements as they are happening in the world, because I think we are living in a period um, of very exciting and also terrifying uh, challenges. Exciting because there are indeed a whole set of new social movements in many places in the world, um, and challenges um, which are perhaps you know, really difficult to meet, and perhaps we will not as a human race meet them. We are living in a time when we have to think about actually the possibility of the future of the human race. So, this is a very challenging thing to do, and I've got how many minutes? 40 minutes? 35 only? Who's? Ah. Yeah, you have about um, 37 minutes, 20 seconds. <laughs> 37 <laughs> minutes and 20 seconds. Okay. All right. Okay. So, social movements in the neoliberal age. I don't know, I think there are so many people here who have been very active in social movements. The, the people from Marikana have already stood up, um, but there are clearly other from crisis committees. Um, there are many people who have been very deeply engaged in social movements. Um, I still you know, as an academic, and I am an academic, um, like to sort of pose the question of why we should study. This is a, uh, you were talking about research, why we should study social movements. I think this is a time in the study of social movements when we should ask that question. So let me, let me uh, uh, give you my suggestions as to why we should study social movements. And let's see if I can convince some of the more activist uh, people why academics should get involved with social movements. Well, I tell you, most academics study social movements. Where I come from in the United States of America, they study social movements because they're interested in the causes of movements. You know in the United States of America that it becomes, in the eyes of many sociologists, a miracle, a miracle that there is a, is a social movement at all. Because we in the United States think of the world made up of individuals. And how is it possible to have a social movement? And so they find, you know, these academics like myself find that the world is, does have social movements. And the puzzle is, how is it possible? So they figure out and they spend their time studying causes, of which I'll say a little bit more in a few minutes. So that's one reason to study social movements, to figure out why they exist at all. This is not a question you probably pose in South Africa, where, you know, the issue is, you know, there perhaps has, sometimes some people think there are too many social movements. Yes. All right. <laughs> so that's the U.S. point of view. There is a whole, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's an industry of studying social movement causes. 
Now, why really do we want to study social movements? Perhaps because we want to we see social movements as a vehicle of social change. A social movement, after all, is collective action. People working, collaborating together to either change the world or, in some cases, to conserve the world. Um, that means acting on the external world, acting on the external world. That's why we're interested in social movements, the way they act on the external world. But we're also interested, we're also interested in how we or they, we as participants in social movements, actually, actually develop a whole new understanding of who we are. Collective self-transformation. I teach in the United States and I have these undergraduates, 200 of them, right in front of me. And I, I ask them, how many have been in the social movement? Perhaps one or two, perhaps three or four or five people stick up their hand. You know, they have great difficulty in understanding what I teach sociology because they haven't even been in a movement that allows them to see the world in a broader perspective. That's what social movements often do. They involve intellectual self-transformation. And what is interesting, of course, is the relationship between the way we change as activists and participants and the way we actually change the world beyond. But there are other reasons why we might want to study social movements. I think social movements, protest movements, studying them gives us a good sense of the world in which we live, the constraints on the possibilities of change. We learn about what is happening in many places in the world, the way that state and market um, combine in an offence against society, against social organisations. And so I think another reason for studying social movements is it gives us an understanding of the limits of the possible change. It gives us a sense of civil society as a political terrain. And I want to suggest one final reason why the study of social movements is, 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 is important. And that is because social movements have often thrown up ideas of alternative worlds. We live particularly in this stage of world capitalism in a world that seems inevitable, natural, and the future is a continuation, if we're lucky, of the present. And I, I think that social movements um, give us a sense of what alternatives they may be. And this is very true of the social movements in South Africa. Have generated alternative visions of how to run economies, ideas of cooperatives, how to have politics, alternative ideas of democracy. So there, this is thrown up by the participation of people collectively in social movements, imagining alternative worlds. So that's good enough reason, I hope, to study social movements. Now, uh, I think we're living in a period where social movements are actually changing their character. And I suppose what the challenge I am throwing open to the audience here um, is, to what extent is South Africa converging or diverging from the way social movements are uh, developing in elsewhere in the world? So let me give you a sense of social movements elsewhere. Uh, as president of the International Sociological Association, I have the great honor to be able to travel around the world, to be here today and to be elsewhere. And everywhere I'm looking at social movements. So this is giving you a sort of a, a whirlwind tour of social movements in the world today. And we'll start four or five years ago. In, well, I'll start actually in December 17th, 2010. Does anybody know what happened December 17th, 2010? Hmm? No, no. Hmm? The Arab uprising, and that began in a country called Tunisia. And it began with the self immolation of a uh, fruit seller called Bouazizi. And he set himself on fire, which was not an unusual, totally unusual thing to do, it was not unique, but this particular self-immolation actually generated a social movement completely unanticipated in Tunisia, which deposed the then dictator Ben Ali. It was December 17th by January 14th. 
he was out, gone, fled. Nobody could imagine it, least of all himself. Um, so, and what happened in this movement was basically, it was a movement that began in the hinterland of Tunisia. It was a struggle by workers, by miners. It was a struggle by dispossessed peasantry, dispossessed by agribusiness, that then converged with small middle class protesters in the capital, Tunis, um, concerned with both political freedom but also concerned with increasing economic Im oppression that emerged from the result of policies by the state of a what we call neoliberal character that basically subjected large sections of the population to un unregulated market forces. You know about this sort of thing in this country as well as anybody. Arab uprisings, well, this set in motion struggles in the neighboring country, much bigger Egypt, <laughs> And there you have the January 25th revolution, which was televised broadly all over the world. People assembled in Tahrir Square, and very quickly, Mubarak dictatorship collapsed within three weeks. And we've had an ongoing struggle of a very complicated character that has now ended up, and this is very important, has now ended up back with the military in power, popularly in power, I might say. Field Marshal Sisi, who is now sort of, is a, almost like redeeming Egypt because their experiment with democracy went awry for reasons that we could talk about. But social movements have all sorts of unintended consequences. And there is a great dispirit in Egypt today about the sort of the denouement, the outcome of the struggles over the last three years. Well, I could talk a lot more about Arab uprisings in Libya, uh, problematic too, in Syria, civil war in Bahrain, in Yemen. But anyway, what has changed is the consciousness of people, the sense that they can actually affect history. That is new. Indignados, now we're going to Southern Europe. The, the protesters, the indignant protesters against austerity measures in Spain, in Portugal, um, in Italy, and in Greece. In Greece, perhaps, where the austerity was greatest, who had general strike, and we're talking about 20... 2011, 2012, and what we must note, I will re refer you to Greece in particular, is the emergence not just of left-wing groups, but right-wing groups. Um, the Golden Dawn is a right-wing neo-fascist group that's not interested in expanding people's freedoms, but actually contracting them. So the austerity, the economic austerity that hits Southern Europe leads both to movements of the left and the right. Then we have the Occupy movement, 2011, September. Um, Zuccotti Park, New York, the 1%, the 99%. A struggle against finance capital that is ruling the world, definitely in the imagination of the uh, followers of the Occupy movement that spread across the United States and indeed spread across the world. Almost every capital in the world had at least a small Occupy group occupying some central square, some central location near some big finance capital banking. So the Occupy movement hasn't sort of sustained itself, but again has left its residue in people's understanding of what is possible and also what is problematic about the world around us. The Occupy movement. Was there an Occupy settlement in Johannesburg? There was? Little one? Yes? Yes, 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 definitely. Ah, look who's there. Okay, all right. Hi, Jackie. Uh, Jackie will know about social movements. Right. So, yes, so Occupy movements. Then we have environmental movements, heart, close to Jackie's heart. Um, yes, environmental movements have been increasingly significant because we face ever great environmental problems, whether it be the mines, for example, in Latin America that generate a lot of protest because of the way that water has been polluted, whether it be toxic waste, whether it be struggles around land in India against the special economic zones and uh, struggles against those zones that indeed are being increasingly paralyzed, or whether it be the struggles of Chinese peasants 
Chinese villagers against the coalition, the collaboration of real estate capital and uh, the part, local party elites. There are struggles all around, around issues of the environment, around water, we know about that around here, and electricity. The APF was, of course, a very, fig Im a very important uh, movement in this part of the world, but with our equivalent elsewhere. So environmental struggle, and of course the biggest and most difficult to, to grasp and to engage is the climate change. And there are, of course, climate change movements, and the, the effect of, of global warming has, it's differential across the world. As recently in the Philippines, I understood very quickly why there was a powerful uh, uh, environmental movement concerned with climate change there, because the Philippines is basically, a lot of it is below sea level. So as there is global warming, of course, they're the first to get hit. And generally, there are the, the poorer people are going to be hit most immediately by global warming. It's going to have differential effects. Anyway, there are environmental movements concerned with major issues today. And then how can I forget labor movements? Now, I think, and my position here is rather controversial, I suppose, that basically labor movements are on the retreat, that labor movements of the old style are having increasing great difficulty organizing themselves because today to be exploited, and it's going to be a theme of this talk, to be exploited is a privilege. To be exploited is a privilege. Everybody wants to be exploited. Not everybody. Those who have not the means of existence want to be exploited, want to have a job, and it is increasingly difficult to get a job for many people in the world. You have unemployment rates in this country of, well, who knows, 30%, shall we say. But of course, there's a lot of debate about what the number actually is. The point is that labor has now in order to struggle to engage in all sorts of new and different strategies. Strategies that involve appeals to politics directly. Informal labor in India, perhaps 95% of the labor force has not sort of leverage, can't withdraw and effectively strike and actually get their employers to make concessions. No labor has to go to the state. So in f new strategies of appealing to public, so symbolic struggles have become increasingly important over the last decade for labor in many places in the world. And Marikana obviously is a fascinating and important uh, story and continues to be with the strike in the platinum mines, uh, continues to be how far can you go with strikes, how to get public support for strikes. This is an ongoing struggle of great importance, to which I'll come back in a minute. And finally, not finally actually, student movements. What is happening in the world is the privatization of universities, another part of the sort of neoliberal agenda, and with privatization comes what? Student fees, increasing student fees, and with increasing student fees, education is no longer public. It is now, in a sense, privatized. And so differential effects on different parts of the population. Student movements are fighting all over the world for the retention of public education, free access to education, student movement. And finally, I have to put in the post-communist movements they are quite complicated. What happens in the post-Soviet world, for example, is a transition to a capitalist world. And of course, the protests and the organized movements against state socialism, as I call it, communism, other people called it, whether it's in the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe, those protests eventually unseated communist parties with the hope that a new world would open up. There's nothing worse, they thought, than communism. Capitalism must be better. Well, they discovered otherwise, and they moved, in a sense, from one prison to another prison. And so you do find all sorts of struggles in places like Bulgaria and in Romania against austerity. You get struggles in Hungary, but they're often of a more right-wing character. You have struggles, actually, most recently in Ukraine, a very complicated story. But in the beginning, it was a struggle for the identification of the Ukraine with Europe, but became very quickly a struggle against the reigning 
oligarchs that inherited the wealth of communism who had basically taken over the politics of the country. It became, in a sense, a class struggle and then was turned into a geopolitical struggle. There's another complicated world of very interesting struggles. All right, that was my whirlwind trip, and I used a lot of time. Okay, but it doesn't matter. All right, now I wanted to ask you, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to rhetorically ask you, um, what are the repertoires, the ways these social movements carry on their activities? What do they have in common? Well, what are they? They are nationally specific, these movements. They are nationally specific. They are very distinctive. They are fight on a national terrain. And Irma, yes, we'll need Gramsci for that, yes. But I'm not going to invoke Gramsci anymore. That's, that would be a digression. They are nationally specific movements. They are globally connected. They influence one another. What goes on in New York is actually influenced by what went on previously in Tahrir Square. That and, and what goes on in New York influences what goes on, for example, in Latin America and vice versa. There is a global connection among these social movements. I think, and this perhaps is more controversial, that most of these new movements work on the assumption that electoral democracy is beyond their reach, that electoral democracy if, does not have a systematic and deep effect on what goes on in society, that electoral democracy has, in a sense, been hijacked by the capitalist class, particularly finance capital. That finance capital dictates the very limits, narrow limits, under which we can engage in electoral politics. So there is what, what uh, Sigmund Bauman calls a separation of power and politics. That, in fact, electoral democracy does not actually give us much. So we have to figure out an alternative form of democracy, direct and horizontal. This is the participatory democracy. Um, this is a democracy in which people themselves organize in a prefigurative way how to think about and organize society. And this, of course, is a long tradition here in South Africa of, that has gone along with in post-apartheid South Africa with electoral democracy. So of local participation. And one sees, for example, in service delivery protests, this is a sort of local reorganization of politics. Well, and there are, of course, many other examples from South Africa. So there is this vision, then, of these new social movements of an alternative idea of democracy. And then I would like to add that there's a lot of talk about the insignificance of social media as being necessary for these movements. And if you look at any of these movements in the Middle East, for example, and perhaps even starting in 2009 with the Green Movement uh, in Iran, you see there was a protest around the, uh, around the supposed fixing of elections. There, a very authoritarian regime, you could see how people were able to organize themselves through the use of social media. It happens all over the place. I would argue that that is effective if and only if there is also not just a virtual space, but a public space where people can actually congregate and have face-to-face -face interaction. The two necessarily go together. And that is why, of course, there's such an enormous struggle over these public places. Um, in usually in urban contexts. And finally, I think that these movements have been heavily repressed, but they have turned out not to be so easy to repress. What is so significant about these movements is their flexibility, is what use an ext I don't know if you read Zygmunt Bauman around here, he's a uh, Polish sociologist, spent most of his life actually, well, half his life in, in, in England, and every few months he writes a book about liquid something. Liquid, <laughs> liquid truth. Liquid love. Liquid love. Oh, you do know about the guy, yes. Anyway, he hasn't written this book. He has to write it called Liquid Protest. Because um, I think that protest 
this new wave of social movements has a certain liquidity. Disappears one place, reappears elsewhere. Uh, you know, suddenly you think it's all over. No, it reappears, reasserts itself. This has definitely been the story in places like the, in the Arab uprisings, um, in, 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 in many of the environmental movements, and I think in South Africa too. It appears repressed at one moment, but then reappears. Yes, yes. Americana is probably an instance precisely of that. Well, anyway, those are my six features of the repertoire. And, you know, I sense I'm throwing you the challenge. Is, do, do the social movements in South Africa fit this scheme or not? Hmm. Okay, now. Who? This is interesting. All right. I got... How much? I got about... I would say 12, 13 minutes. Okay, and 10, ten seconds. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me quickly go what through how sociologists have spoken about social movements. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite topic. Yes. Well, in the early days, 19th century, that's when sociology began. The people who write Max Weber and Emil Durkheim, I, they probably won't be familiar to many of you here, but they're very famous sociologists, uh, one French and the other German. They basically thought, well, you know, there are social movements even in the 19th century, but, you know, they are irrational response of inarticulate mass, I'm quoting Max Weber, uh, responses to social change that have a sort of, that, that, that are sort of emotional, irrational responses. Spontaneous. They're not to be taken seriously on their own terms. They are, in a sense, a reflection of something much broader. Well, sociologists in the second wave decided that this was a uh, hopelessly misguided view of social movements. We're now talking about post-1960s, where suddenly social movements were seen as actually a form of politics outside the parliamentary terrain. And they began talking about the interests involved in social movements and they, you know, this is mainly in the United States, started developing these theories of how movements can exist at all. And so they start talking about the importance that social movements have resources, that is, that they have economic resources, that they are able to have resources that connect them to one another. They talked about how, in fact, the framing of the way in which social movements present their protests is very important in actually developing cohesion among the, the participants. And largely, they were state-focused. Um, and that, that's the sense that they were extra-parliamentary forms of politics. But what is significant is, like the United States, everything is universal. You know, this is, you know, you do sociology in the United States and you produce a theory. You don't say this is what happens in the United States of America. You say this is the world. <laughs> and so it's, 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 it's making the particular universal. I don't know if you know, but the United States is a very, very strange place. And so to build general theories on the basis of a strange place uh, is going to lead to a problematic generalization. But anyway, let me move on. Um, I think there is a third wave. Well, let me just uh, let me be fair to the Europeans. The Europeans, particularly in France and Italy, generated a theory of new social movements that were new because they were located in the 1970s in an era of post-industrialism in which social movements were all about the direction of society, the culture. It, it was a struggle over cultural programs. So second wave social movement theory had its universal character on the one hand, but there was also another element, another branch that recognized the specificity of the context, post-industrialism, that generated a peculiar identity-based uh, identity social movements. Well, we're not now living in a... We are living in a post-industrial period, but more important, we are living in a neoliberal period. We need to have a theory of social movements, an understanding of social movements that explicitly takes into account the world in which we live, a world of marketization, where markets are continue to be ascendant, and they have been ascendant for, since the middle of the 1970s. So, all right. Now, I have only, yes. 
12 or 13 minutes now. And this is what I want to do now, is just give you an idea of how I would reconstruct social movement theory um, in a way um, that goes to tries to make sense of this. And I think it's important to make sense of social movements to understand the possibilities of social movements, the possibility of their emergence and the consequences they may have. Now, I was going to tell you, I don't know how many people know that this guy, Thomas Piketty, has actually hit the headlines uh, as no other economist has in the last, I don't know, century. Ah, probably post Keynes, let's say that's, yeah, century. So, this is a book called Capital in the 21st Century. So, it's a, you might say, a, a, an attempt to uh, a propagandize, uh, to, no, to, to exploit the connection with Karl Marx's three volumes of Capital, and he's written The Capital for the 21st Century. And this is essentially a book in which an economist, an economist, let me underline, an economist is concerned with what? Inequality. Inequality is concerned with distribution, but not only income in and the income distribution, but wealth. This is, this is amazing. Not only is it amazing that economists are doing this, but it has got the attention of everybody, at least in the West, in Europe and the United States. Every day, the New York Times has another something or other about Thomas Piketty, who's this young guy, 40 years old, who has gathered together data that show incredible... This maldistribution, the incredible inequalities on the basis of income, but most importantly on wealth, arguing that this is not some meritocracy, this is what he calls patrimonial capitalism. For an economist to say this is very significant, and for it to be broadcast across the world is very significant, and I think it's the result of these movements themselves that has brought to the attention of everybody the significance of inequality. And so, interesting enough, he begins the book by talking about Mary Connor. On August 16, 2012, the South African police intervened in a labor conflict between workers at the Marikana Platinum Mine near Johannesburg and the mine owners. The stockholders of Lamin, based in London. Police fired on the strikers with live ammunition. 34 miners were killed. As often in such strikes, the conflict primarily concerned wages. Mm -mm. The miners had asked for a doubling of their wages from 500 to 1,000 euros. A month after the tragic loss of life, the company finally proposed a monthly raise of 75. The episode reminds us, if we need reminding, that the question of what share of output should go to wages and what share to profits, in other words, how should the income from the production be divided between labor and capital, has always been, has always been at the heart of distributional conflict. Now, that could be the opening lines of Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. History is the history of class struggle. Huh. And here we have an economist, you know, talking about this. It's amazing. So if you remember anything from this little talk of mine, that you should remember Thomas Piketty. And his book is going to be a canonical figure. And everybody who's anybody in the world has to write a review of this book. <laughs> yes. So it's going to go on for some time. Look. My argument, and I, I, these are figures from there, I'm not going to go through them, but he, he actually refers to the increased inequality uh, by wealth and by income in South Africa. Um, but I'm going to argue that this man has not got the whole picture. That in fact, exploitation, he never uses the word exploitation, but he might well have done, that exploitation, I'm going to argue, is not the key to understanding social movements, but commodification. That is markets. That is the way that we are turned into things that are exchangeable. That nature is turned into things that is subject to market forces. That money itself becomes a commodity bought and sold, and that knowledge is something bought and sold, that these four together actually can be used to understand these social movements. That's the provocation I have. So it's contra, contra, contra Piketty. And it's funnily enough, I'm taking the idea that is so central to the economist, the idea of the market, and following this fellow Karl Polanyi, using the idea of the market as the instigator, the experiential instigator of social movements, rather than exploitation. Hmm. Are you going to agree with me? 
Oh, thanks. Very good. Well, okay, I got one convert. No, not convert. Probably already believed that before. Okay, Paul Polanyi. Okay. Eight minutes. All right. I know Carl Polanyi has not been summarized in eight minutes quite the way that... All right, fine. <laughs> I'm going to reconstruct this fellow, Polanyi. What's Polanyi's main point? He wrote a book called The Great Transformation in 1944. This is, the, this is a canonical text now in the social sciences. And basically in that book, he argues that if you push markets, if you push exchange, if you push markets too far, it will destroy society and there will be a counter movement, a reaction against markets. So if you make labor subject to unregulated exchange with no protections, so workers can be fired and hired at will at wages that they don't actually define, then you're going to destroy labor as a potential use value that capitalism will destroy itself. So he argued that marketization pushed far will lead to a counter movement. And what he didn't figure out, he thought, and this was interesting about the book, he thought that when you push the market too far, there's going to be a counter movement, a reaction. And what will they appear, as did appear, fascism and Stalinism, as well as social democracy um, and New Deal. So basically what he argues is that their state in the 1930s was an essentially a response to pushing the market too far. Um, the state, the government sought to now regulate the market, but it did so in some places where there was no freedom, fascism, or Stalinist Soviet Union. So his claim is that push markets too far and you can get disastrous, disastrous consequences. And he thought humanity would never be so crazy as to ever try this experiment again. Well, he was wrong. In the 1970s, marketization took another leap forward. Marketization beginning in the 1973-74, <laughs> beginning in Britain, United States, and in other countries, but particularly there, markets were reasserted. And the whole idea of regulating markets was to boo, and the idea now was to liberate the market, and we would liberate people accordingly. And that wave of marketization we're still in the middle of. Middle, we don't know where we are. We're still in it, of ascending marketization. And the question is this. Where will the counter-movement come from? Will there be a counter-movement? And do the social movements we are talking about, we see in the world, can they be seen as a counter-movement to marketization, or do they endorse marketization? The key concept, I think, that Polanyi introduces but not develop is the idea of a fictitious commodity. Something that, when exchanged, loses its use value. When you actually have unregulated labor market, then actually the, pr the price of labor wages fall to such an extent that labor cannot even reproduce itself. And, of course, we have seen that in South Africa's history. But what is perhaps newer is the new ways in which money is commodified. And what that goes along with is what? Well, what happens is... There it became an accumulation, trillions, trillions of dollars was assembled by capitalism, and capitalists didn't know what to do with it. So they started handing it out to people. And so people were handed out with, on the basis of debt, debt that they could not themselves, they could not themselves uh, deliver on. And so we live in a world of increasing debt, of individuals, of communities, of states, of institutions. So money being a commodity now is something that we make, people are making money from money. If money was intended as a medium of exchange, and now it is a source of profit. Nature is another feature. We talk about nature, he talked about land, we can talk about water, we can talk about air, uh, we can talk about even electricity, if you will. But basically, the commodification of these entities is generating profound crises, profound crises in communities. In fact, one of the problems is it's not the commodification of nature, but the failure to, to commodify nature. It is that we, no long, we, 
We never sort of see how important clean air might be. We no longer see how important water is. We no longer see how perhaps land is because it was never given a price and so people can now appropriate it and use it. Part of the problem is that the climber is not a commodity. So it's both commodification and the non-commodification of things that is very crucial. And finally, the fictitious commodity that Polanyi never talks about is knowledge. That is, knowledge, I think it was, what did you say it beautifully? The university that does not share knowledge. The knowledge that is not shared is not knowledge. That's, well, that's, sorry, it's gone by the board. Knowledge is commodified. <laughs> knowledge goes to those who can afford to purchase it. Uh-huh. The university is no longer a public institution, but a private institution has to be funded. One way is to increase student fees. Another is to sell your knowledge, not just the dissemination of knowledge, but the new knowledge. Who can you... I don't know as DVC whether you are concerned with selling your knowledge to corporations. I will not ask you this question. But it is a very big issue and universities are being transformed the whole world over and if they're not being transformed, they're disappearing. Look at the continent of Africa, for example, and the disappearance of universities as we know them. South Africa being an exception. Anyway, look, I think, and I have no time, perhaps this is wrong, it's one, one, one way in which time is, shorter time is good. I won... My claim is that by looking at the ways in which the commodification of these entities combines in different places gives us a sense, an understanding of the new social movements. And it will be interesting, for example, to think about Marikana in terms. Yes, the commodification of labor, the wage. Yes, perhaps the commodification of money, because of course part of the strategy was actually to extend loans, yes, to the miners of, of, of the platinum mines. So in a sense, the debt economy also intersected with that struggle. And of course there were struggles around land, land dispossession, land non-accessible. So, I don't know quite how to fit in knowledge in the Cap Maricana, uh, the Maricana drama events and tragedy. But anyway, I can talk about different social movements and actually, I have a slide there and you can absorb it. <laughs> um, but labor, I believe that Guy Standing was hanging around South Africa recently talking about the precariat. Yeah, but proletariat is no longer the proletariat. We have a precariat, precariousness, indignados, very concerned with the possibility of, not, well, of the impossibility of getting a wage, being unemployed, having enormous debt, and having wages that don't actually are not survival wages. Land dispossession leading to waste, landlessness environmental movements, and money, financial crisis, debt. The Occupy movement was at the center of the Occupy movement was, of course, the 1% who run the world and knowledge. Universities in crisis, the way in which universities are made profit centers and the significance of this has for student movements. All right. That's a dismal story. But... This is, I'm sorry, I got, ooh, I got two minutes. Two minutes, I, well, I, I, I can't go through this, but let me, let me give you the gist. It's important, not only that we understand social movements in terms of what I would say the articulation, the relation among the commodifications of these entities, labor, nature, money, and knowledge, but we have to understand why is this pressure for marketization now? As academics, as researchers, we have to understand what we're up against. Where does marketization come from? Now, Polanyi doesn't have an answer to that. And actually, you have to reconstruct Polanyi and recognize that this is not, neoliberalism is not the first time there is market fundamentalism. It is the third wave of marketization, I would argue. And this picture that I've reconstructed from Polanyi's history suggests that there are these three waves, 1795 to 1914, 1914 to 1974, and 1974 on. Now, 
we have to recognize that capitalism does have these waves of marketization. Now, this is taken from Polanyi. He was very Eurocentric. He had one section, well, he had almost a chapter on South Africa, and he had a very, well, we would laugh at it today. It was written in 1944, but his vision of commodification, marketization, was that basically South Africa was destroyed, it's right in 1944, was destroyed by colonialism through the extension of the market. We know better now that, in fact, the strategy in South Africa of colonial rule, South African rule, was more often to protect pre-capitalist modes of production to ensure cheap labor. It's a com much more complicated story, but what he writes about South Africa in its history in the 19th century really applies increasingly, I would argue, to South Africa today. But the point is that this picture is British-centered, Eurocentric, and we have to figure out what these waves of marketization look like in different places in the world. So, I'm suggesting that actually each of these waves is driven by a specific fictitious commodity. Um, and I'm suggesting that in this third wave, ultimately, we're going to have to face an environmental crisis. And the question is whether we can actually face it, whether there will be a counter movement that will have to be of a global character. In the 19th century, the movement was of a local character that moved to the state in the 20th century, it was of a national character. The state was central to the counter-movement. And now I think we have to have a global counter-movement if we're going to deal with finance and the environment. And Polanyi says there's necessarily going to be a movement. Sorry. I don't think there's any warrant to say there's necessarily going to be a counter-movement that will actually save this planet from itself. So... This environmental catastrophe, here we are, moving up. The question is whether we will have a counter-movement. Dot, 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 dot. And the question is, the question is whether the social movements of today actually contribute to the deepening of marketization or the containment of marketization. And that a big question. It's not clear that the struggles that we see that are very much a response to marketization don't, in the end, deepen marketization. Yeah. And so, conclusion. <laughs> Let me summarize. Social movements, as we know them today, increasingly not increasingly, are defined for the time being in, by their national context. All the movements that I see are organized and are, have a peculiarity defined by the national field of politics. And the question is whether there can be some sort of connection among these social movements despite that national context, whether there are ways in which one can go beyond just the mutual influences, but building up what, I didn't realize it, um, I do have Gramsci here, building up some sort of global war of position. And that is we have to be thinking beyond the nation state as well as within it. The problems are big enough within it, but ultimately I think we have to be thinking beyond it. Second, we have to understand the underlying economic forces, capitalism, that it lies behind these social movements. We have to understand third wave marketization and to understand the specificity, the particularity of the marketization that we now exist in, are facing every day. We have to understand the relations of commodification, the relations among the four fictitious commodities, labor, money, nature and knowledge. They are intimately and intricately linked to one another, usually one of them dominating and shaping the others. And finally, the question I mentioned a minute ago, the social movements that we see in the world today and the counter-movement, are those social movements part of a counter-movement against marketization? 
do the social movements, the indignados, the environmental movements, the Occupy movement. They may grasp the importance of challenging marketization, but is the effect to actually generate a, and consolidate a movement against marketization, or are they appropriated by marketization forces? And to understand that question, we have to understand what lies behind the waves of marketization. What is impelling this marketization? What is impelling the destruction of societies on this planet? And there, the only answer, it seems to me, is capitalism. But we have to understand how capitalism continually pushes marketization forward. What is the force behind that marketization? We have to develop a theory of accumulation, excuse the word, of accumulation of capital. And that's what old Piketty, Thomas Piketty, he has no theory of capitalism. <coughs> He's an empirical researcher, tells us how inequality has changed over time by wealth and by income but no theory of capitalism no theory of the crisis of capitalism we need such a theory if we want to know under what circumstances our movements will have an effect and why they may be necessary if there is to be a reversal of marketization and there are theories marxist theories and there i will bring back some people will be happy that I am prepared to recognize the importance of exploitation. That exploitation actually is the way in which capitalism lives off the labor of others and actually generates surplus and profit. And it's the dynamics of exploitation that underlies accumulation. We have to understand the waves of capitalism. And there are theories. Um, there are theories of long waves, there are the theories of chondrati of cycles, but basically these are sort of, sort of obscure areas of Marxism. We have to actually pay a lot of attention to the dynamics of capitalism to understand the place and of, of social movements. We have to understand, this is my last sentence, we have to understand the limits of the possible if we're going to understand the possibilities within limits. So on that note, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> mm. no. well, thank you very much. Uh, now I think I understand what is neoliberalism. <laughs> <laughs> I am going mm. to call Dr. Thomas of the Hydra to actually to respond. And I'm going to give him three minutes Uh, Dr. Thomas of the Hydro uh, is only going to give a heavy text. So I am going to uh, ask uh, the second respondent, um, Trevor Wally, where, where, where have you been, Trevor? Where have you been? You know, it has been almost a decade ever since uh, we heard about you. <laughs> He's, he's, he's been studying Kondraty of Cycles. <laughs> he's gone underground. Um, exactly. you, are, you are going to translate for two respondents, a uh, mine worker from Nonni, uh, um, uh, that is um, Tulakele Dunga, and uh, Tumeka Magwana. Benda does not have six. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's Lonnie in Maricana. Okay, 
I'm very happy to hear someone coming from abroad talking about Marikana because it seems to us that our suffering was a secret. I worked 10 years uh, at Lonmin in Marikana. Uh, at the moment we are on strike, but it's not just the 16 weeks. We started in 2012 with our strike. long I think that because we are the same people who are on the mountain and we got shot and very four of our comrades died. So that is when the strike began. Our strike now is a continuation of that strike. Well, we are in a bad state situation because as miners we don't really have a government. Because in 2012 it was the government, the state police who shot us and killed us. So it's not our government. <coughs> Okay, we've been um, uh, four months on strike. We have no intention of going back to work until we get 12,500 funds. So there is a lot of talk and intimidation and threats, but we're not uh, worried about that. We have suffered too much as workers. We continue struggling. We're getting 4,000 a month. So we can go to the strike that is why we're on strike. Uh, we want a better wage. Well, we are on strike and uh, you know, we, we ask for support, but you should know that even if it takes a whole year, we continue fighting until we get to uh, <laughs> Women's Organization, Americana. My name is Tumega Mangwangana and I come from the Sikala Song Organization in Marikana. Eh, Tinasi Aba Mama, eh, Abati Abatada, Asebe Tujula, Sakwazi Ukuba Kunga, Sakwazi Ukuba Fumana. Sema etan guabo, sango mama ubo, sango sisi ubo, sanga bandwa na kabanye bako. As this women's organization, we were able to support the miners after they got shot. We were able to be their sisters, we were able to be their mothers, and actually be the foundation behind solidarity. Say for my girls, kala songe women organization, gonaeto, lezinge is social movement. We were able to form this organization due to the help of other social movements.
We pride ourselves as a women's organization. We are saying we are not going to turn back. We are continuing forward. I mean, before he strikes us in Marikan. Sasi Lamba, Galenke, Futi, Jatu, Bale, Intela Slabanga, Ipeteran, Uba, Aikola, two cent Isayo, Eti Kaifika, Yo Pele, Majale, Ashia Gusebez, a song is done. For us as the mine workers, we see no difference between the salaries we were getting back then um, and the salaries or the, exist, the non-existence of the salaries we have now, it was actually much better now that we're not getting a salary because before we would get paid. But as soon as our money comes in, loan sharks are actually chasing after us. So we feel that where we are right now is much better. Yes. We see that uh, money is actually dug by our mine workers, yet enjoyed by those who wear blue collars. So what we would like to say is that we are tired of this, we see that uh, we are getting change as the workers. If anyone is getting money, it is those who are in Britain who get it. Because the very president that we vote for is not protecting us, is not supporting this movement. So our heart is breaking. Yes. 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 I do not expect that people would re-elect the ANC and the current president, seeing as there was no change before. We had thought and expected that we would actually be a new president, not the one we have now. Teta Gamfungu, who passed the vote in Minyaka, in Minyaka and Minyaka, Sibeko ex wedu, of ex bedu, Sibabeke Lilise, who the contos in Fumana, Nademali is mine, Panesh, Wakulo, our president, Balos and Africa. For, for very many years, we have been voting, I've been placing my ex on the ballot. Yet what we see is that it is the very president and those in power who have shares in the mind, and perhaps that is the reason why we are here. Americana Snava Tetele, Sitele of Anini, Sibizo Anini, Sitianda, oh my, oh, oh, Maricana support campaign. Kabona bas visa, Kabona bas support, I own my first university, no my UJ, Kabo Abanta Abas Tetelela, Abanta Basetalen Kut, Kabay, Kabo Abanta Bafoisa out his colors of Zetu, who president who say, who picked his hand. Out. 
Father is a pumina lo mani. As bank, upuma kusiti zero zero. What we have noticed is that right now, is that right now our primary concern is the education of our children because we see that the government is not supporting us in any way. We have our furniture being repossessed by different and various um, furniture shops, yet they know that we are unemployed right now and cannot pay all of these debts. Makangene, <laughs> upresident, I would like to say that um, I'm quite shocked that the president is still in power right now. I say that this is the last time he will ever be elected because we see that he's a president who does not care for the pain of others. versus the institutionalized versions of social movements. Um, and I think about in our, in our country at the moment, the social movements and the organizations that have the most voice with government and the most platform to speak are ones that are started mostly through middle class uh, people coming up with ideas of what the interests are um, of the masses of people who they, they are not those people, they represent those people's views eventually, but um, they're, they're not those people. So what are the implications of the commodification of civil society and the institutionalization of civil society itself? So if I am a Marikana minor, my access to resources are limited. My access to power is limited. My access to people of influence is limited. If I'm sitting in Sant and I decide I want to act on behalf of the, the Marikana minors, um, I've got better access to the things that will give me that kind of power. Um, so. If, I'd just like to unpack that a bit for me in terms of what do we do about the marketization effectively of civil society itself. Um, the second issue is you, you mentioned lifestyle a little bit and you mentioned um, the need to be employed and that we all want to be employed. Um, I've been thinking about the relationship between those two things in terms of South Africa and we need to think about what kind of lifestyle is being created. Because again, the commodification, we are creating lifestyles and selling lifestyles that people cannot attain, and they're putting them in a position where they need to be employed, they need to have access to income, they need to be at uh, the mercy of big corporations and somebody that, that can give them a salary. And how do we begin to tackle that relationship between lifestyle and employment or unemployment? My name is Cleopatra Shevi. I'm from Operation Kanyesa Movement, Stroke Democratic Left Front. Um, it's not a question as per se, but I think it's an eye-opening. Our main speaker mentioned very important factors, uh, namely uh, it was how to target the market or deal with the market. Uh, I think it will be more wiser to plan 
around a mass workers party which will lead and guide us the way we want rather than following the capitalist organization and their leadership because I'm very angry where I'm seated because Kwente Mantashe one year mentioned that he is a socialist but today he doesn't sing that song of socialist because it's yeah. a capitalist thank you Thank you very much. My name is Ketani Boniswa. I'm from Pakistan. I'm a member of Greater Western Area Concerned Resident Association. I've never been to university before. I'm happy today, Comrade Michael, you are here. I managed to intrude university. Even the English that I'm currently speaking don't think I'm educated. I just, you know, adopted the district <laughs> when I was passing by. <laughs> the problem why I did not come to university is because of the government said I've got a right to information and promised that it will disseminate this information as much as it can. But should I procure the information, terms and conditions apply. I must purchase the information. <laughs> Comrade Michael, you have just uttered something and then you said you'll come back and then I don't know why you've thrown that. You know, you were about to advise us particularly about the public support concerning or regarding the Marikana issue. You see, at Pakistan, a troublesome township in, in Houghton province in South Africa, we've got a motto that says, we will never lose a hope until we reach the best. Yes. Let Marikana not lose a hope until they reach the best. And with regard the issue of socialism, if ever the socialism is going to utilize this kind of comradeship strategy that is utilized by the current government, which is, according to my perspective, a kind of nepotism, then socialism will never make it. Because I am going to be the president and nominate the ministers of my choice, which are my brothers. I'm going to nominate the Chief Justice, Minister of Justice, Minister of Police, Mayor National Commissioner. Who am I going to, who's going to arrest me if those people are my oh, brothers? Wow. <laughs> now, as much as, let me tell you something, let me stand up. <laughs> the people who were registered to vote just uh, weeks ago were about 25 million when, who's that woman? Pansi Sakula Sakula says. And only approximately 18 million who voted. 7 million did not vote. And the total population of this country is approximately 50 something million. And I believe people who did not register and vote are, are political people. And I must say it clear that the political affiliates must not oppress those who are apolitical. It is their democratic right not to be to participate in politics. Now, those who are apolitical, who are in majority, ANC is not in majority. People who are apolitical are in majority must come up with a strategy to ensure that they take over this country and revolutionize it to make it a better place for everyone. Amanda.
Okay, my name is Tajuan from Pakistan. Uh, with the youth of Pakistan, we registered to vote, but next thing we saw the government sending red ants to attack us. So there is, there is no democracy for us. Uh, the municipality, you know, doesn't help us. The mines don't help us. For the youth, there are no sports facilities. And in fact, you know, uh, the children of Pakistan are nowhere in the world. You can't find any kind of youth doing good things in the world from Pakistan. I can assure you that there is no child from Pakistan here at UG. There is the best to do this And and if there is a child to, of beggars down here, there will only be two, not more than that. So I want to know what have we done wrong? And the worst part is that the ANC threatens us and says, if you don't vote, you won't get anything. But it's our right to vote or not to vote. So uh, we are crying at beggars down. I think we have come to the end of the proceedings. Most of, I don't know whether Michael you would like to respond because most of the most of the issues that we reached were mainly for information. Would you like to respond? Yeah. I'll respond for one minute. I mean, it's 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 just I, I just like to say it's it's uh, only in South Africa uh, will you find a, a, such an extraordinary community here uh, in which social movements are present uh, at in a, sort of a, a supposedly uh, wealthy academic uh, context. So I, it's great that you are, you are here. And I think it's, it's very, uh, what, what would be great also if the university were to move into Balagstan? Bagastan. 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 Oh, I see. Okay. I'm an old guy, I can't hear properly, okay. <laughs> but I mean, that, that's a, there are alternative visions of the university in which the university goes into the community as well as the community going into the university. And I think there are so, that, that, that 
that uh, there are much lessons and much of what I have just heard in a sense confirms my vision that the so the movement around Maracana does subscribe to the more uh, the general features of movements um, in, in, in the rest of the world and the, the, the hostility to the linkages you would put it very beautifully but much better than I can the linkages between the ruling class and the state and this is the sort of imaginations of so many social movements so and then the question of the market I mean you're absolutely right the market it seeps deeply into our lives, much further than I even spoken of today. But that is why we have to be thinking about the world in terms of the market, to actually recognize precisely how our lives are being shaped in all dimensions by the market. That will be a necessary condition, I think, for the expansion and extension of, of, of markets. And finally, the mass party, I've forgotten who was, the mass party, I can't resist saying something about the mass party. I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there is a huge question how it is these disparate movements will actually become in some sense uh, combined, solidary with one another and, and party is one answer. So I'm really surprised that nobody's mentioned the EFF here. <laughs> the EFF is here. Yes. Okay, I mean, uh, well, you're being very coy and shy about the EFF. Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, that's another question we have to raise. Where does the EFF fit into this sort of scheme of things? I'll leave you to figure that one out. Thank you. I think a uh, breath of fresh air flowing through my little bit of hair that's left here in a very refreshing way. Um, I found it very interesting and stimulating. It is a tour de force and by virtue of the time constraints, I'm sure you touched on many topics which you could probably dwell on in a lot more detail. Uh, you started off your, uh, your presentation by briefly uh, alluding to the, to the challenge of the future of humankind. These were your words. Um, and you spoke about, um, about the future of humankind in two broad contexts. One being social dynamics, social movements, social development. Um, the other one which you touched on, but which clearly is an important factor in much of your thinking, is the impact of the environment uh, and its limitations. Uh, one thing that we've learned from climate change, which you've referred to uh, repeatedly as well, is that as much as we would as human beings love climate change to be maybe a big problem, but a simple one, in the sense that we can just do one thing and the problem goes away. <laughs> We all just stop driving cars, or we all stop flying, mm -hmm. or we all <coughs> reduce our electricity consumption. It's in our nature to, to want the problem to be solvable like that. Just one thing we've got to do, and the problem goes away. But we all know now that climate change is a vastly complex problem. Even if we all stop driving cars, it would reduce CO2 emissions by three or four or five percent or six percent. If we all stop flying, maybe three percent. So these things on their own do not solve the problem. And it's, so it's understanding the complexity of the problem and the interrelationships between these different factors that certainly has to be uh, uh, central to, to dealing with climate change in a rational and sustainable way. And I think that your presentation here um, has made the point to me as well that perhaps the same thing can and must be said about understanding social change. That no matter how much we would like to reduce it to simple contradictions like labor and capital, um, it's much more complex than that. There are paradoxes that have to be understood 
There are contradictions that have to be understood, and there are apparent contradictions and apparent mm, commodifications, I think, or marketizations, commodifications. So, uh, and I think this is a critical message to leave um, with an audience such as this that consists both of academics, students, activists, student activists, academic activists, um, because if we really want to tackle these problems, we actually have to understand them properly. Uh, and so that deep reflection, which you touched on here in your presentation, is essential. And it is very important that we do not pretend it's not important to analyze deeply and reflect deeply on these, on these issues. However, your presentation also has made clear, and I think the audience's responses have made it very obvious too, that simple intellectualizing is not sufficient either. It has to be translated into action. Different agencies have to come to the fore <coughs> in this regard. And I think for both of these lessons, uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, these are important lessons to leave with us here in this audience. I'd like to thank all of you who are here, particularly those who may not be used to standing up in a university and talking for doing so fearlessly. Um, I can tell you that's probably a lot more than some of the academics that are sitting here or some of the students that are sitting here who may be quite fearful of saying things in an, in, an, in, an, in an arena like this for fear of not looking super intelligent. So, so thank you to all of you for having come and for having made the inputs that you've made here, which are important, I think, to keep those who are based at the university and at other universities reminded about why it is that they have been given the leisure through public funds to do the work that they are doing. I think it's a very important point to make also that the audience that is here and the level of participation is a reflection without a doubt on the work that Peter Alexander and his team here at the university are undertaking. The partnerships that they build both within the university environment and within the broader community environment uh, clearly are important to creating a context and meaning for the work that they do. And Peter, I think that this here speaks volumes for um, the success of your attempts and you should be proud of those. As a departmental official, it's very pleasing for me to see one of our South African research chairs and he's not the only one, I want to stress that, but to see one in action like this and really bridging the divide between the academy and those who sit outside of it. So thank you very much to Peter and his team for this and to the university also for providing the support and the freedom to do this work. Thank you to all of you and I wish you a good evening still. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, Camila Naidu to just say one or two things. Uh, I think the, the, the process is there. There's something, there's, there are some food uh, uh, on the other side. Uh, when you go out, uh, you turn to the left. And uh, it will give us the opportunity to interact and to discuss further some of the issues that have been raised. Thank you very much for coming. This is part of uh, the democratic tradition of South Africa. And uh, let us agree that this is important for our society to move forward. Thank you very much. Okay, but just before letting you go, just hold on for one moment because there is something else that I want to do. Um, but first of all, thank you very much to Thomas and thank you very much to the Deputy Vice Chancellor. Uh, but before you go, there is something else that's important. And that is that um, for those of us who have spent time in Marikana, we know about the hardship of people. Not directly, but we can see it. We can see it on people's faces. We can see it uh, in uh, what they say and, and what they do. There is enormous hardship in the platinum belt. Um, and there is a, a growing movement amongst ordinary people in South Africa to do their best to assist people, to stop them from starving, oh, recognizing yes. that they've suffered from a long period of strike. And whatever we think about the strike, 
we know that we have to stop people in the 21st century from dying of hunger in these circumstances. So what I want to ask you to do is to put your hands in your pockets uh, to find, if possible, a number of large notes uh, to put in a bucket outside so that you can assist those people who have come from Marikana and their families and friends and uh, enable them uh, to stop suffering from malnutrition. Now, I'm very proud to say um, that this is a movement which um, has involved uh, students of ourselves in an appeal, but it's also now being taken up by vice chancellors uh, around South Africa. And I'm hoping that their statement will be published in the papers uh, tomorrow or the day after. And our own vice chancellor uh, is one of the signatories, along with a number of bishops, one of the signatories to that appeal uh, for funds uh, to help uh, children and uh, women and uh, men in Marikana and elsewhere. Um, so with that, I hope that you will uh, leave this room um, with um, the pleasure of having uh, enjoyed a really important uh, lecture, have learned from it, but also contributing uh, to um, supporting people who are engaged uh, in activity in many ways against ne neoliberalism. But I think this has been um, a very, very interesting lecture, a very interesting occasion. You won't find meetings like this anywhere else in the world, uh, a meeting where it's possible for people from Marikana and elsewhere to speak about their conditions, but also to have a response from a Deputy Director General uh, in, in the government. So this is an exceptional meeting, and I hope you'll uh, give a round of applause to everybody present who's made it. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. I gotta take off.